Hello, hello. Hope everyone is good tonight. Oh, got lots of comments here. Hello from Vancouver. How's everyone doing? Thank you so much for joining. Oh, Fran, I can hear a little echo. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Yeah, I hear, I hear the echo, too. I don't. Oh, I think it's other mics. We're just sorting out sorting out some tech stuff. So I see a lot of people are here commenting. Thank you so much for joining. We're gonna get started in just one second. Just letting people get in, get settled, grab a drink, get some sushi, non-alcoholic water, iced tea. Uh, but real quick, greetings, hello from Austin. Hello, Mary, hello, JD, hello, Genevieve, uh, Geneva from Vancouver, New Hampshire, Cincinnati. This is awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining. Just gonna wait one more minute till 7.02 and then we'll get this started. We have a really, really exciting evening for you tonight. Up oh, 7.02, all right. <laughs> so, first of all, um, I wrote some words out, I'll be honest, because although I like to speak off the cuff. So first of all, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you that don't know, know me, my name is Ethan. Um, I'm a writer, director, producer, and writer, director of the film. Uh, I'm also, the national ambassador for the International OCD Foundation. And uh, I'm an individual uh, with OCD and probably a few other anxiety disorders as well. But um, I, I was thinking about this introduction and, and, and thinking about what I would say. And at first I was thinking about telling you guys how um, I never in a million years imagined my passion for filmmaking would, would ever merge with my passion for advocating for OCD and mental health. And while that's true, I think the most honest thing I could tell you is that I never imagined I'd be sitting here at this point in my life. So nine years ago, after a literal lifetime of suffering with OCD, I was 100% certain 100% certain, I could feel it in every bone in my body that OCD was going to take my life. And since then, in the last nine years, there have been a few moments where I have to take a step back and go, wow. And I think this moment right now is easily one of those moments. And so, um, Thank you. Well, first of all, wow. <laughs> but uh, thank you for spending the next couple of hours with us. Uh, it really means a lot to me and everyone involved in this, evening is, this evening's events and the documentary. Okay, so now let me just take you guys quickly through the evening and then we'll get this, we'll get this film started. So first of all, we'll be viewing the documentary, Uncovering OCD, the truth about obsessive compulsive disorder. After the documentary, we've arranged a spectacular panel for you. Uh, panel? Hey! So we have Jeff Shemansky, who is the executive director of the IOCDF, Wayne Goodman, who's the professor in chief of Baylor Psychiatric uh, School of Medicine. We have, I totally mangled that. I'm sorry, Dr. Goodman. Um, we have uh, Chris Tronsden, who you will see is in the, in the documentary, and, uh, and lastly, but me. So this is your panel for this evening. We have some amazing panelists that are brilliant in their field and excellent what they do. This is your opportunity to ask any questions that you like. No questions are off limit as long as they're appropriate. Um, so definitely have your questions ready. And once we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, I'll explain further. But for now, just get your questions ready. Don't load them in yet. Just get them in mind, and we'll meet these guys back here very, very shortly. So lastly, oh, we're good? OK. <laughs> so the last thing I want to do, that, they can join me. This is good. Uh, lastly, I have to thank a few people that made this documentary possible. So um, I want to thank uh, Biohaven uh, for caring enough about our community to want to create um, content like this that can edu educate and reduce stigma. 
I want to thank the International uh, Foundation for uh, helping support and partner with this event. Um, I just want to quickly thank my producing partners, uh, Zachy Rubenstein and Andy Hurst, who are my partners in crime on the production side of things. And lastly, and most importantly, um, the film would be nothing without the advocates that appear in it. So no words, if you're watching you guys, you know who you are, Chris, you're in it. No words can describe how thankful I am uh, to you. Just some background, when we originally created this documentary, it was, it was only to educate clinicians that don't usually um, interface with individuals with OCD, and it wasn't meant for the public. But after seeing everyone's stories side by side, we realized we had something really powerful, and it was something that, that the public needed to see. So we took what we had, we shot some new interviews, and uh, that's what you're gonna see tonight. So uh, sit back, uh, relax, we'll see you on the other side and enjoy covering OCD, the truth about obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD to me is having a graveyard in your brain of the things that you want to love that OCD waged a war upon and just decimated. OCD is a nightmare of a mental illness that has derailed my life. OCD for me has been an evil, crippling monster. A monster in your head that is hell-bent, primally influenced and primally motivated to target and kill everything that you love. What is OCD to you? Feels like you're treading water sometimes, but you can't reach the bottom or reach the top. You're like at that in-between part where you feel like you're drowning mm -hmm. um, and you can't really pull yourself out of it. And you feel like a bunch of bricks on your shoulders and you can never truly come above. But once you do and you do see that light, it's a little different and you view things differently. I think for me, what OCD is, is your brain is just hyperactive and it's constantly looking and scanning for things, telling you consistently that something's dangerous in your environment. And so you're always on edge, you're always trying to protect yourself and you come up with these behaviors and avoidances to keep yourself safe. OCD is a disorder in which you're obsessing and compulsing for at least an hour or more a day. Mm -hmm. And your, your life is literally being restricted as if like you're being killed by a boa constrictor. It's like, it's this tightening mm -hmm. sensation. In essence, suffering with OCD is like being in hell. Mm -hmm. And it's a hell that you're aware of, which makes it really difficult. Unlike a lot of mental disorders, there's this dual existence between this healthy part of your brain and the OCD, and they're existing simultaneously. So the healthy part of your brain is going, everything that you're thinking and everything that you're, you want to do compulsively is illogical and it makes no sense whatsoever. But then the OCD part of your brain is going, you have to do this or this is going to happen. Right. And you listen to the OCD part of your brain, knowing that it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but you just want to get rid of that feeling. If anybody would have asked me uh, if I thought I had a mental illness, I would have said, not me. Uh -huh. I just had no idea. Um, and so uh, it took a while for me to really come to terms with knowing something was wrong and wanting to do something about mm -hmm. it. I was very secretive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as I got older, uh, I became more transparent. As a mom, what does, what does Chris's OCD mean to you? I had no idea um, if he would get better. I had no idea if um, he would have a regular life, if there was treatment that could help him. Um, so it was a very scary time to think that a totally normal person had become almost like a toddler. 
One thing about the disorder is it doesn't just hit you all at once, it slowly consumes you until it gets to a point that's overwhelming. There were so many moments when I was younger, especially in high school, full-fledged um, OCD, but at the time you just don't realize what it is. The definition of OCD are obsessions, right? So mm -hmm. Thoughts, images, feelings on a loop that we don't wanna have. They make us uncomfortable, they give us anxiety, a really uncomfortable feeling. And then to alleviate that feeling, we engage in a compulsion washing your hands, tapping, praying, a variety of things. That compulsion alleviates the anxiety from the thought. The vicious loop is that it only alleviates the anxiety for a short time. After a while, the thoughts come back, the fears come back, the emotion and anxiety comes back, and you re-engage in the compulsion. And over time, the amount that it alleviates the pain is shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until you're compulsing constantly because you're just trying to get that sense of relief. I think that people also assume that OCD is just OCD. You don't have anything else, but along with obsessive compulsive disorder comes a reign of emotions of anxiety, depression, um, intrusive thoughts, suicidal thoughts, and people don't really know that because people don't talk about it. I first noticed OCD when I was eight years old. I've had symptoms of it since I was five years old. I first noticed OCD when I was 12 years old. I had something like this all through college. I had something like this all through high school. I had something like this all through middle school. I first noticed my OCD when I was in eighth grade. When I was 13, I had a massive intrusive thought that sent me into a panic attack, emotional breakdown. It was groundbreaking fear that stopped me in my tracks. One day I was okay, and then the next day I was obsessed, and I couldn't stop being obsessed. So when did it start showing up in your life? It, as early as I could form words and talk and make complete thoughts, I think it was present. When I was in kindergarten, there was an eclipse of the sun, and the teacher was telling us that if we wanted to watch the eclipse, we had to do it this certain way, because otherwise you can't stare at the sun because you'll go blind and I became obsessed that my mother was gonna look at the sun and go blind. So I came home and I told her, you can't look at the sun, you can't watch the sun, you can't go outdoors. I didn't wanna leave her side. I wanted to protect her to make sure that she wasn't going to look at the sun and go blind. And we went through all kinds of, you know, I'm gonna wear a sign or you can call me. I ended up not going to school the day of the eclipse to stay with her to make sure that she wouldn't look at the sun. 11 years old and I was in the cafeteria and we had these like sausage pizzas and everybody had one and I remember someone grabbing the sausage off the pizza and like squeezing it and it like exploded and it got all over me. A normal kid would be like oh my god but I was like there's definitely germs all over me and oh. I'm probably gonna die from the sausage pizza and like wow. as crazy as that sounds that's how I knew that something wasn't right. About junior year of high school was when I first started to have thoughts about men because I'd been dating a girl for a few years. So we broke up and then I started to have these same sex thoughts and I would obsess over them mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have them. So I started to obsess about everything. If I had a bad thought about somebody, I would have to tell them and apologize for having that thought about them when at the end of the day, it's just a thought. It was high school when it really started to hit. I just felt like I had to do these rituals to stay safe. It was just something that I can't always explain to people, but my gut, my brain, everything in my body had made an agreement that I had to do all this ritualistic stuff. So I started bleaching everything I owned. I started doing all this cleaning and, and separating and isolating. What was sad is like with my sister, who I'm close with as well, and then my mom, like we were so close, but I kept pushing them away because these rituals started to become more important. And I think that was the hardest part is I didn't really have a name or an understanding of what it was. So that's where a lot of the anger and frustration came as well as I felt I had to do these things, but nobody was telling me like, hey, you don't, it's a disorder. And so it made me really angry. Um, I turned mm -hmm. to like alcohol and and drugs to kind of self-medicate. And I think my mom treated it just like a bad teenager. And mm. so we really just lost our relationship and we're fighting a lot. And our relationship was really just yelling, screaming, and punishing. I went to go see my first therapist in 2009, mm -hmm. but I got my actual diagnosis in 2011. I would wake up and I would think my eyes are wrong. My nose is swollen. My ears are upside down. And I knew it wasn't a natural thing. And I was just scared to death. 
I really thought that I had almost every disease that I heard about religious OCD. So really being afraid of offending God, being afraid I was going to hell, being afraid I wasn't a good Christian, trying to be perfect. I also suffered from incest OCD. So being afraid I was attracted to my family members and felt like I couldn't be around them. Homosexual OCD, thinking that I might be gay and not wanting that as a 12 and 13 year old. In my mind, I truly believed I was being punished and had done something wrong. So most of my compulsions were around the religious piece with repentance and prayer, but also very much avoidance and rumination and mentally reviewing on the sexual intrusive thoughts. One of my compulsions was to stay home from school because I thought I was sick. And no one really understood what was going on because I kept saying that something was physically wrong with me. I would count to 105 whenever my mom was out. I counted to 105 thinking that it would keep her safe. Uh, I washed my hands upwards of 500 times a day. Uh, and I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know why I was washing my hands so often. I just knew that they had to be cleaned and they were never clean enough. It's very hard on the siblings because my daughter would be quiet so that she wouldn't be more trouble. And, you know, she did that for many years, but she just kind of faded away so that all the attention was on Chris. And we just were trying to get him through without getting arrested or doing something horrible, just get him through his teenage years. You know, it's funny because we don't always, I think, um, you know, talk about this period. And I know, um, Obviously, at the time, it was just a lot of selfishness because I just felt like I had to do these things and I was in danger. But hearing my mom mm. talking about it, knowing the pain that I put my mom and my sister through, you kind of just don't remember that. You were so in a in a place of like confusion and anger and turning to alcohol and drugs, which is not going to help the situation. And, you know, having my mom feel like, okay, how do I parent? What do I do? Putting someone through hell. And that's like a regret I always have. And obviously I didn't know, um, but just knowing that I put my mom, my sister, my family through that. First, second, third, fourth grade, they were really hard. I mean, I was just constantly afraid of everything. I was afraid of swallowing. Every day going to school was a massive battle, crying, screaming. I would fake illnesses. I would fake, I would do anything to just stay at home and not go to school because of just all these fears and thoughts and bombarding my head constantly. If I'm being really honest, mm -hmm. I was in denial of, I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be not like the normal kids in my school where, you know, they could do whatever they wanted when they got off school. But instead I had to go and wash my hands 10 million times till my skin fell off because I was contaminated. I had a public face and that was, I was going to school. I was working as a waiter. I had friends, but at, behind the scenes on my own, I was spending hours and hours doing all these obsessing and compulsive behaviors. And then it just got too overwhelming. I couldn't do it anymore. I wasn't able to show up to certain schedules at work. I couldn't make it at certain times. That's wow. when everything went downhill because now I didn't have a job to get to. I didn't have school to get to. I was living on my savings and just every single day I was waking up. I had rituals I had to do throughout the entire day, compulsions, obsessing. And then I'd get so tired and exhausted and finally fall wow. asleep. I had this terrible fear of illness in high school. I carried three thermometers around with me every day and took my temperature 80, 90 times a day. A headache was a brain tumor and a fever was meningitis and it was just all this extreme health anxiety. And I couldn't leave the house certain days. My anxiety was skyrocket to where um, I couldn't even say my name sometimes in a public environment because I had to count how many people were in the room, mm -hmm. how many people I could hurt, how many people would be around me if I just fell dead on the floor, who would help me? And those aren't those are thoughts that I was thinking, but when I talk about them now, I'm like, how could I have ever thought those things? But they're so normal for people like me. The time from diagnosis to treatment, actual treatment was 17 years. So I didn't receive the proper treatment, exposure response prevention, and other treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, until I was 30 years old. I kept OCD a secret starting day one up until I was 20 years old. I kept my OCD a secret for a long time. I kept it a secret from my mom. I kept it a secret from my friends. Unintentionally kept it a secret for a long time um, because I didn't understand what was going on. Yes, a huge secret. 
for almost two decades. Even after my diagnosis, I kept parts of it a secret. Thinking you might molest a child, how do you tell someone that? Thinking you might be attracted to your own mom, how do you tell someone that? I kept OCD a secret for 20 years because the content of my obsessional thoughts were so scary and so intrusive that I didn't think anybody would understand what was going through my head. I thought that if I were to talk about what was going on in my head, that I was going to be locked up, misunderstood. I got so sick with OCD that I became completely bedridden. It was really, really dark. I was doing OCD things that I had never done before, like hand washing. I'd become afraid that I was accidentally going to poison myself. What if I hit my head? What if I gave myself a brain bleed? What if I was going to die? I got five CAT scans in a week at five yeah. different hospitals. I, I had to go to a, an acute psychiatric facility and they diagnosed me as psychotic. They didn't even, I was at a professional acute psychiatric facility and they told my parents that he does not have OCD, he's psychotic. And it was terrifying. It was the most terrifying place I've ever been. I, I got really, really depressed. I mean, to a level of depression I came and described where the only reason I got out of bed was to do the compulsions, but I didn't feel like there was any out. It was to a point where I just felt dark every day and I just didn't have the will to live. And so um, this is always hard to talk about in front of her, but um, it got to a point that I just couldn't do it anymore. I just really couldn't. And it's, I think the saddest part is because my mom and I were so close and my sister and I were so close. And obviously like I should have reached out at that point. There are so many times where I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just not do this anymore. But uh, I mean, obviously I only can ever think back to one time where I truly wanted to end it all, which was May of last year. But other than that, you know, you, you tend to just not want to go through it anymore because it's just painful. It's not something that you'd ever wish even on your worst enemy. Since I was a teenager, I've been in and out of treatment about four times. There were two big events that happened. Um, the first time when I was about um, 19, I had a few suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And then again, when I was 21, um, they were really cry for helps, but on legal document, they would probably be called suicide attempts. It took a little bit of time to like get up the courage to, to commit suicide, but mm -hmm. um, I just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. So um, we had a garage that we only used for storage and I pulled everything out of it and drove my car in the garage. And so I ran the car and I just left myself to die. And from what I know, from what my roommate told me, because I had a roommate at the time, and she told me that she like went in, tried to like kind of get a hold of me or, or make enough noise to get me up and I just wouldn't move. And that she ended up calling 911. And all I remember is like somebody asking me if I was okay. And then remembering being in like a hospital, I was like really, really upset and confused. And I had finally come up with my own personal solution to this hell that I was dealing with at all times. And it kind of gotten taken away from me. And I remember them like, I remember kind of like, oh no, I just fell asleep. Like I just wanted them to leave me alone. And I was kind of thinking, how am I going to do this again? And they had told me at the hospital, they're like, you need to be living with someone. You need to get some help. And I remember telling myself, like, I need to have a conversation with my mom because I'm going to attempt again. I don't, nothing's going to get better. And so we set up a time and I remember um, being in her living room and kind of sitting her down and just telling her that I attempted suicide and I need help. And it was funny because like she had a way different reaction than I thought. I thought that she would just be like flippant or brush me off because we had such a bad relationship at that time. And I remember her crying and you know, being really worried. And that's when she kind of jumped in and just told me like, we need to get you help. And, and so the process of finding a therapist was really, really tough, but I just kept saying yes to anything my mom would ask because I just was at that point where I couldn't put her through the pain that I saw when I told her. I, I would never have known what was going on. I would never have known what happened. I would never have had a clue why he did it. Yeah. So we just, that was the only focus, just finding him a purpose, finding help. I would think of that. Like, if I would have done it, there was no no. You know, I mean, that crushes me now. As if I would have gone through with it. And she had no idea. And I know her. She would have blamed herself. I still want this. <laughs> but, I mean, we all, all moms blame themselves. We should have seen it. I should have known it when he was three. You know, I should have been able to see it.
the shame, the embarrassment, and the guilt of the thoughts, the fear of this really must mean that I'm a bad person. I was terrified to let my parents know. And it took a really long time, a really long time, because I just thought I was a bad person. I didn't know it was a treatable disorder. It's like, you can't treat immorality. I thought, you know, you can't treat being a bad person. You you are, you aren't. Um, and I tried not to be. I never told my mom or my dad what the real thoughts were and what I was really worried about. I kept it to myself for a year until I couldn't anymore. I truly thought that my friends would not want to be my friend anymore if I told them. The person that I kept it a secret from the longest was my mom because I thought that she would be ashamed of me. I thought that I'd be a disappointment. I thought that she'd be embarrassed. I had no idea that I was living with a mental illness. I truly believed that in the scrupulous piece that I was doing something wrong and God was punishing me. I can't even imagine the healing and growing and also getting treatment and figuring out what kind of treatment. What a, did the road seem long for you? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I think the way that my mom shows love is she doesn't show it like in a traditional way of like warmth. And I've learned like my mom, <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but she shows it by action. Mm -hmm. My dad went online and we found the um, International OCD Foundation. We started to, to find resources and it turned out that there was a clinic 20 minutes from my house where I'd lived for 14 years. I first went there. I went to the right place. I sat down on the sofa and the therapist said, we hear you. We understand you. We know exactly what you're going through and we can help you. Did you believe that? No. I bet you did. Not at all. Like I wanted help, but every other therapist had told me that. Why should I believe them? So therapy was difficult. I would feel like when I sat down in the chair at the, my therapist's office, I remember him saying, okay, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do to, to, to say hello to the OCD? Like bring it out. And that was traumatizing for me. Mm. I mean, it's exposure response therapy. You're exposing yourself to your biggest issues and your biggest triggers, bringing them to the surface and dealing with them. Mm. The treatment for OCD is exposure response prevention, ERP, where they expose you to your fears. When they expose you to your fears, instead of compulsing, you resist the compulsion. You sort of engage the anxiety and the discomfort and the uncomfortable feelings and you sit with it until it starts to go down. And then you trigger yourself again and you do that over and over again. And what happens is it's called habituation. Mm. And so eventually over time, the more you expose yourself to what you're afraid of, you start to habituate and respond less and less. I started therapy and I love my therapist now. She triggers me more than I have ever been triggered in my life. I remember when I went to my first therapy session, I remember walking in and thinking I would give a million dollars if I had some sunglasses because I was so occupied with who might see me than getting well. Because of the suicide attempts, waiting six months or eight months wasn't an option. And I remember um, my mom found a, a treatment center and they called me and just wanted to make sure that I was on board as well. And I was still at that point where I wasn't on board and happy and excited, but I just was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes, I guess, because I don't have another option. And, you know, talking to them about once a week and, and the therapist saying like, you know, because that was all we could afford and because of the distance. And, you know, I remember her asking me like, you're going to have to do a lot of the hard work at home because you sound severe. You probably need more, but you're going to have to do the hard work at home. And I was like, I'll do anything. And so that's kind of how our treatment started. How did you get better? I got better because a bunch of people that loved me didn't give up on me. My therapist decided the best thing for me was to get out away from my parents and go to this residential program in Boston, Massachusetts. Did this program for two and a half months. And then one day we did an exposure where my therapist made me hit my head. And then he's like, okay, great. Now go to town and go get a haircut and live your life. I got to down, I was middle of getting a haircut and I, I convinced myself that I had a bleed. And I jumped up from the haircut in the middle of it and ran out. And again, not 100% of me believed, but, I, but, enough, of but enough of it believed that it wasn't willing to take the chance. So I went behind an apartment complex and I, I found a rock, a sharp rock, and I cut my head open right here. And it wasn't to hurt, that wasn't to hurt myself. It was just to sell that I had fallen on the ice and hit my head. So then I cut my head open, I walked around, found a snowbank on the curb, and I literally just laid face first in the snowbank and pretended to be passed out until a passerby came and found me and called 911. 
But I'll, I remember I was in the back of the ambulance. They would had my phone and they called my dad. And I just remember him screaming, do not take him to the hospital. He's faking it. He's lying. He's, 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 a, he's a patient at, at this residential program. Whatever you do, don't take him to the hospital. And I had heard the EMT go, he has a cut on his head. And I was like, ah, I knew that would come in handy. But I mean, looking back on it, the illness was so, I mean, it's so sick. Mm. It's so sick. And it wasn't to hurt anyone and it wasn't to to fake anyone out. And it was it was to save myself. Mm -hmm. Went to the hospital, got a CAT scan. They were like, you're fine. And I went, okay, it's it's a heroin addict getting his fix. Trying to find a therapist, call, make appointments, get there would have never happened without her support. And so having my mom really take this seriously, I think that was like a big part of it is my mom took it seriously. So I started to take it seriously and then getting the information initially like, hey, this is a the debilitating disorder. This is what's going on in your brain and your body and getting an understanding. And then having my mom always be there, like we're going, you're going to therapy. And I never missed a session. I was always mm -hmm. there. And that, that is one of the reasons that he got better. He did a lot of hard work. Um, I just got him there. And um, we don't know how. He tells me that he thought he didn't have a choice. I'm less than 5'2", so I don't know why he thought I could do anything. But he, I guess it was in my face. Mm -hmm. You're getting in the car and right. we're going. And I went into the office and all my treatment team was there and my parents and my treatment team in Florida were there on the other line. And they basically said, we have a plan. And the plan is you're not allowed to come back to Florida. If you come back to Florida, you'll be arrested and you have to stay in Boston and make a brand new life and you can't have any relationship with your parents anymore. And if you do that, then you can continue to get treatment and therapy and people will you know, support you. But if not, you're just completely on your own. I, they backed me in a corner I couldn't get out of. And three days later, I moved into this disgusting, I call crack house in the south side of Boston that I found on Craigslist. And it was terrifying. I got into the room and I closed the bedroom door and I literally pushed the dresser up against the door and I got into bed and I laid there for six days. And I didn't eat and I didn't drink and I didn't take my medications and I was going to the bathroom and I was, I was paralyzed and petrified. On day six, I had a couple of realizations. The first realization was that nobody was coming for me. And that was a terrifying realization because if I kept doing what I was doing, then I was going to die. Right. Well, then I had to ask myself if I wanted to live or I wanted to die. And so I dug really deep and asked myself that question. And I felt like I had nothing to live for anymore. Everything was taken away from me. And I had this terrible illness that I couldn't get rid of. I was broken. I was unfixable. I was unmendable. But despite all of those things, there was this thing inside of me that was like, you can't die. Like, you can't kill yourself. You, this can't be for nothing. The next thought was, well, what do I do? How do I, how do, how do I go about doing this? And the first thought was like, well, you have to go out and get out of bed and go buy food and, you right. know, all this stuff. I got out of bed and I thought, you know, oh my God, what if I hit my head on the headboard? But suddenly the fear of maybe dying, maybe not dying paled in comparison to the certainty that I was going to die if I kept staying in bed and not eating and not taking care of myself and just letting myself wither away and die. And suddenly survival became more important than the mm. OCD. And that was the epiphany. What is the best thing that you can do for someone that is in the in the throes of it and in the getting a diagnosis and learning how to navigate it for themselves? When he started therapy, the therapist talked to me and she gave me some information on how I could best support him because the support that a family gives is counterintuitive. It is completely opposite of what you expect to do as a mother. So if you don't get that education, you don't get that information, you continue to harm your child by doing what feels so natural. So, um, and that's one of the reasons that a support group helps is because as a mom, you're doing things that feel really bad. And then you can talk to other moms who say, no, it's gonna work. It's gonna work, just stay in there. Very, very slowly. I started to do small things. I started to eat. I started to get outside. I took a train and a bus to go visit the therapist. I started going to the therapist, saw them three times a week. And then I noticed this exponential growth 
After four or five months, my therapist suggested I reach out to my parents. I reached out to my parents. We started emailing. We started talking on the phone. They came to visit. August came around. I was like, can I, can I, I don't have to stay here anymore, right? I can go live my life and follow my dreams wow. and do everything that I want. I went home for two weeks, uh, visited my family, and I moved out to California to sort of follow my dreams. I was first treated with evidence-based treatment when I was 15 years old. So that was three years after my symptoms started and two years after I was diagnosed. I first uh, started evidence-based treatment when I was in my mid-20s. I had a lot of attempts at, at evidence-based treatment that were unsuccessful uh, because of how scary it was. But it was when I was in my later 20s that I really buckled down. My first um, about with evidence-based treatment was my first experience with therapy. So I blessed that my very first time in therapy, I got evidence-based treatment. So I first had my first OCD symptomology when I was 10 years old. And I wasn't until 32 until I first uh, was uh, successfully and properly diagnosed with OCD. So that's 22 years. Yeah, that's OCD. That's a thing. It's treatable. We can do a lot for you ever want anyone to wait as long as I waited and to wait as long as so many people wait. That's my whole goal. That's why I share my story. Uh, I know in my case, I think about all the wasted years. Mm -hmm. If somebody in my inner circle or family uh, would have noticed, oh, something's wrong and maybe directed me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard not to live by shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah. And I always wondered, um, how far along down the road I would be. I don't want to get emotional. If somebody would have just simply told me or if I was educated, I had no idea, none. I think for us, it's always helping people um, not make the same mistakes that we made. Mm -hmm. And then there's also part of me that's always like, well, why can I have been born like 15 years later because the hell that I went through. What you've gone through, what advice would you give to somebody that might find themselves in your shoes and in, the, in your parents' shoes? Yeah, I wouldn't be alive without what my parents did. And I can tell you that my parents did what they did because they had good education and good therapy. Mm -hmm. OCD is very much a family disease. Your parents are not parenting you, they're parenting their, your OCD. Your, your mother and father are not married to themselves, they're married to your OCD. They live for your OCD. Enabling and reassurance and all of those things are literally the worst thing you can do for OCD. But as a mom and a parent and, and a father, that's all you know to do. That's that's parenting. We don't want our child to hurt. We don't want you to suffer. I think if you put it in the context for a parent of you're not hurting your child, you're hurting their OCD. Right. And that's a very important differentiator to know that if you enable, if you reassure, if you parent the OCD, it will make it worse. When you put something in your face and you deal with it, it's going to get easier for you as time goes on. And that's what I'm doing with ERP. Okay. And it's, it's certainly helped me and made me um, deal with, like, if I were to touch underneath of a table, that would usually freak me out. But now I can just touch the underneath of a table and be like, okay, I'm okay. And that's directly because of the ERP yeah, for you. Yeah, because I'm, I'm exposing myself to germs and stuff every day through ERP that I can do it in my, my life mm -hmm. now. So it's interesting when you're doing all of this work with the exposure response and you're, and you're feeling like it's not getting anywhere. Do you think that that was actually working you just didn't know it a or thousand you, percent okay without a doubt there is no way that i would have gotten better without everything that had come before that okay so when i was going through that stuff on the street when i was living on my own when i was surviving if i hadn't had any of that background i wouldn't have made it so let's just get this on the table yeah that anybody at any point in your life saying oh i am ocd or oh i'm I have so much OCD about this and that. That's not connecting. That's not saying, oh, we're similar. That's minimizing That's and minimizing. not understanding. Yeah. That's the worst thing you could say. Okay. So if someone is flippant or, oh, you're just a little OCD, all those kind of um, narratives would be a great turnoff. Uh, so I would like to be respected, mm -hmm. you know, just feel I'm accepted like any other disorder that's out there. You know, no difference. Just treat us with some respect. People with OCD, we crave certainty. We have to know certainty. And the singular key to overcoming OCD is embracing uncertainty. Okay. It's being okay with uncertainty. It's not trying to feel better. It's not trying to stop the thoughts. It's not trying to stop the feelings. It's not trying to be happy all the time. It's simply being okay, not being okay. 
it's really important to remember that you are not your OCD. I have taken so many medications, um, I actually don't remember them all. I take paroxetine, the generic for Paxil. I am still on it. A lot of people have to try multiple medications, sometimes a cocktail of medications. I feel that I was lucky. What does your future look like from this point on? I think the biggest happiness about my future is OCD doesn't come as a factor into it. OCD had such a conversation with every choice I made, whether it was where I lived or who I talked to or when I left the house. And I think the biggest thing for me is freedom, just having that freedom to make any choice I want. And it's it's difficult to explain, but you know, almost feeling captive for so long and getting to a point where the disorder isn't controlling you. It's, it, it's a level of freedom and just free choice that I never thought I had. And so I've done really well for myself, if, if I can say so myself from turning it around. I mean, I was able to get an advanced, you know, master's degree, do extremely well all A's in, in, in graduate school and become an OCD therapist and now treat individuals going through the same thing. And my mom and I do a lot of advocacy together. We run a free family and loved one support group. So kind of sharing our story and insights to help other people coming up. And today I can sit here and tell you it's not easy. Right. I'm not okay, but I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm getting through it. I'm taking deep breaths where I need to take deep breaths. I'm going to therapy. My OCD is <laughs> better than it's ever been. Even before I relapsed, my oh, OCD has really? been way better now because I know I have those tips and tricks up my sleeve to where if I have a day where I wake up and my anxiety is bad, I can be like, okay, take that deep breath, take that step back. You can do this. You've gone through it before. Staying well from OCD, not relapse, is not about not having the thoughts. And it's not about not having the feelings. It's your response to the thoughts and feelings. It's all about not compulsing. It's all about embracing the discomfort and embracing the uncertainty. And when you do that, when you don't give oxygen to that fire, the fire shuts down real fast. There's such a lack of diversity within the OCD world, the community. I call ourselves the missing faces. And I, for me, it's so important to bring that diversity, awareness to mental illness. I love that you're talking about that. <laughs> Thank you. Because someone's going to watch this and they're going to see you and hear you. And they're going to feel like they're less alone. Mm -hmm. And that what they're feeling is not crazy. You know, I speak all over the world to sufferers and family members and clinicians in an effort to educate and destigmatize and make sure that nobody has to go through what I went through. The only way I can make sense out of it is to give back mm -hmm. because otherwise, what was it all for? And I don't take days for granted. Mm. I just don't allow myself to. So if there's something in my life that I'm really interested in or really care about, I fit it in and make it happen because I know what it was like to have so many years where that was just not something that I could do. Wow. And making my mom proud. She better be proud. That's one of my jobs. <laughs> <Of> <laughs> <Go course. on. laughs> Part of people getting diagnosed sooner and getting the proper treatment sooner is definitely about spreading awareness and just making sure everyone knows what OCD is. Anything we can find out to help people live better lives and be diagnosed and treated sooner. New research is critical to our survival, to our continued welfare, the continued destigmatization of OCD is crucial. It's so important. I mean, these are people's lives. And I would definitely tell anybody out there that's struggling with this to not give up and to accept the fact that you're a little different, but that doesn't make you any less of a warrior than you already are. So to be able to be engaged in life, no matter what is happening, I feel this tinge of gratitude no matter what, because right. at least I'm playing, at least I'm in the game, at least I'm not on the bench. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that I'm grateful for that. I, I am so thrilled with where he is. I'm so thrilled of who he is. I'm so proud of who he is and how hard he has worked. He makes changes in people's lives. He, he really helps people and wow, to go to work and say that you really changed somebody's life is great and I'm I'm proud every time he tells me about it or people come up to me all the time say wow I'm glad we found your son you know I mean my son is doing so well something so I like that and how are you now like how is life feeling now for you right now it's great <laughs> <laughs> and if you would have asked me a couple of weeks ago you know it, it, it goes up and down mm -hmm. but I've never felt um, better in my recovery uh, 
as I do right now. And I know it's just putting the work in and being an advocate has really, really helped me. But then there's those people that you do meet and a community that you create, that you learn that you're not alone, that you can get through this. You can understand more about yourself. You can educate other people. And that's definitely a silver lining that I've found and a blessing in disguise through all this storm. I want everybody out there to know there's hope because we did not have that. Our first, our first thing that I was told is he'd never get better. That was the first thing. And I can't even relate how devastating that was to be told that. Um, I remember sitting on my bed, looking at a picture of him and just crying, like, I lost my son. What do you mean there's no hope? So I just like to dispel that right away. There is hope. There's treatment and there is hope. And there may be times where people feel like giving up or it's not gonna ever happen. Our journey wasn't pretty. There was definitely <laughs> some, some missteps, but we always kind of got back on our feet and made it through. So there's hope and there's help and people can get better. We deserve to be happy. We didn't ask for this. It's a challenge for me. It's always somewhere present, but the days are good too. You know, it's not always bad. Did you, do you enjoy this? Yes, I did. Um, I was a little nervous, but you're great. I'm proud Thank of you. you. I'll never stop going to therapy ever. I'll go to therapy every, every week, probably for the rest of my life. Right. Cause I know that's what helps me. Right. And finding that is, is truly super rewarding and reaching out and educating yourself and educating the people around you are the best thing that I could ever give an advice to anybody in going out to those communities and asking for help. Mm -hmm. Asking for help is not, not a bad thing. Right. Asking for help is how you get to places like where you're, you're happy with yourself, right. you know, getting to those places of happiness. I don't know that many people can say that they remember the first time they felt joy, but I actually remember the moment and the day and what was happening and when it happened, because I don't know that I'd ever felt it oh, before. What was it? And I was walking down the streets of Boston and I was walking from work to home and the sun was setting and I looked up and it was just a beautiful sunset and like the colors, but I think I felt what I felt like I was supposed to feel my whole life, but never did, you know, the beauty in nature or whatever. I, I, I felt something more than just functioning throughout the day. I felt joy. I felt happiness. I felt connection. I felt serenity. I felt all of these things that I had never felt in my entire life. And in that moment, I was like, oh, that's what life's about. Mm. That's what this is about. It's not about functioning. It's not about getting through. It's not about, it's not about going through the motions. It's about this moment right here and this feeling. And I'll always remember that moment and it'll always be very special. But what's even more special is that I've had thousands of moments just like that since then. For too long, there haven't been any advances in the field of OCD treatment. For over 20 years, we've had the same uh, treatment constructs. And, and what Biohaven's focused on is trying to bring forward a new treatment, a novel treatment. The genesis of our OCD program really was within the uh, Yale uh, academic clinics. So I was a very young researcher at the time, just leaving my residency that I completed uh, at Yale. And I began to run uh, the Yale Neuroscience Research Unit. So as we looked at the pathophysiology of the disorder, uh, it quickly became apparent that in OCD, there's a hyperactive electrical loop in the cortex, the striatum, and the thalamus, the CST loop. That loop happens to be heavily innervated by glutamate. So we believe that if we directly modulated that loop with uh, glutamate agents, uh, we might actually improve the, the, the treatment for patients with OCD. And we were surprised to see that um, after treating just a few patients, we saw beneficial effects. And it was really those clinical observations that then had us uh, pursue a whole line of research focused on glutamate modulators for patients with OCD.
Trigruzol is the product of seven years of chemistry work, and it's a prodrug that allows patients to get the therapeutic levels that they need of Arilizol. And the team here really is working uh, nights and weekends to make that a, a reality. Biohaven is a uh, local biotech startup that began first here in New Haven, Connecticut, and spun out of uh, research originally at Yale University, but then incorporates that academic background and expertise with large pharma drug development uh, experience as well. So Biohaven really represents the best of academia and the best of pharmaceutical drug development. By individuals participating in the study, they're not only potentially benefiting themselves uh, in Biohaven, but they'll be um, benefiting future generations of patients. Whether or not trigrulizol works or not in OCD, we will advance the field together. We're all hopeful that it will work for patients, but if it doesn't, together we're learning more about this illness, we're educating other scientists about it, and we're increasing our knowledge base uh, that one day we hope will lead to a cure for OCD. All right, so first of all, I wanna thank you all for watching. Um, I, I wanna say a few things before we get to the q and I think you guys have some um, really great questions and I wanna address them all. I, I just wanna say like in reading your comments that you're heard, you're seen, we're here together doing this together and and all of our stories told in that documentary were in service of those that can't yet tell their story. We're here to scream for you. We're here to yell for you. We're here to be your voice. So we're all heard and can, people can get the help they need. So it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter how much money you make. That's the goal. That's the goal. And I know that we won't stop doing that until that goal is a reality. So if you're here tonight, we're one step closer to that. I think now let's get to uh, the question and answer. It's hard to kind of segue over because there's some heavy stuff in that, um, but definitely stick around. So here's how this is gonna work. Uh, like I said before, we have an amazing panel for you. Um, I'll make some brief introductions, just tell you who they are and then we'll get straight to your questions. So I saw a lot of questions circulating during the documentary. Um, so definitely ask them again um, or new questions. We'd love to answer them. Um, initially, please only just submit one. And then as we get around and make sure everybody's gotten in, we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. We probably can't get to all of them, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible. And finally, um, after I tell everybody, uh, tell you who, who everyone is, if you have a question for a specific person, just put their first name right before your question, and we can direct it right to that person. So uh, with that, let's let's get this started. So let's bring everybody up. I'll do some quick introductions, give you guys a chance to uh, write your questions in. So first up, we have Chris Tronsden. Wave, Chris. <laughs> All right. So Chris, you obviously may recognize from the, uh, from the documentary, he so bravely shared his story um, with his mom. Chris suffered with severe OCD and, and body dysmorphic disorder until receiving specialized treatment. Um, no longer under the control of disorders, Chris now works in the mental health field, as he said, treating OCD and BDD sufferers at the Gateway Institute. Uh, Chris has shared a story of recovery on the Montel Williams Show, Dr. Drew, Fox 5, San Diego, and by speaking at IOCDF annual conferences, uh, Chris currently serves as vice president of OCD Southern California, an official affiliate of the International OCD Foundation. And I look up to Chris. Uh, Chris. Chris was advocating while I was still uh, screaming and crying and running, hiding in my room at, uh, at, at conferences. So I, I love anytime I get to talk with Chris is a real pleasure. Um, right above Chris, Chris in our Hollywood squares, uh, we have Jeff Shima, Dr. Jeff Shemansky. Uh, Jeff is a clinical psychologist who has served as the executive director of the International OCD Foundation for the past decade. Previously, he was the Director of Psychological Services at the OCD Institute at McLean Hospital. As a clinical instructor in psychology at Harvard Medical, he supervises pre-doctoral psychology interns through McLean Hospital's internship program. He's given over 100 professional presentations and trainings and has appeared in over 150 media stories about OCD and related disorders. He's a co-founder and past president of the ACBS New England chapter 
and the author of The Perfectionist Handbook. Um, and finally, uh, we're very grateful to have uh, Dr. Wayne Goodman, the professor and chair of the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor University. Got it right that time. Uh, he's a specialist, he specializes in obsessive compulsive disorder. He is the principal de developer, along with his colleagues, of the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, known as the Y Box, which is considered to be the gold standard for assessing OCD. Prior to, many of you probably have had it if you were uh, in treatment. Prior to joining Baylor, Dr. Goodman was a professor and chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System for seven years. He was the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Florida in Gainesville for nine years. He received his medical degree from Boston University of Medicine, completed his internship, residency, and research, fel research fellowship at Yale. One of the coolest things um, that we have on here is in 1986, Dr. Goodman co-founded the nonprofit at the time, the OCD Foundation, which is now named the International OCD Foundation. Uh, he served as chair of its scientific advisory board for the first 10 years. Dr. Goodman received the Lifetime Career Achievement Award from the International OCD Foundation at two, in 2012. So I think it's pretty neat that we have um, one of the original co-founders of the foundation. And that and, he's still alive. And that he's still alive, <laughs> you know, looking, looking good. And, uh, and uh, the current executive director. So why don't we get to some questions, guys? So let me, let me scroll back up a little bit just to before I start talking too much. And uh, let's see here. Just, I think that we're gonna, okay, here we go. Let's see here. Uh, let me look for something with a question mark. Uh, Sadia, I think I got that right. Uh, this would probably be for Dr. Uh, Dr. Goodman. What medications would you suggest? How about any natural herbs? Well, starting with the medications, the uh, only class of medications that have been established as effective in OCD are the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And often when you hear them referred to as the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and that would include drugs like fluoxetine or peroxetine, which was mentioned in your film, or Luvox or fluvoxamine. I won't name them all. Uh, and, and then another medication that's not as specific for serotonin uh, but also is uh, uh, can be very uh, critical to treatment of OCD called clomipramine. It's one of the older drugs. Now, all these drugs that I just mentioned, all these medications, are classified as antidepressants. But they all have what they all have in common is they have very potent effects on one of the brain's neurotransmitters uh, called serotonin. So they all affect the serotonin system. And that's how we think they work in OCD. In terms of the second part of the question, natural products, there, there are several different options out there that, uh, that they haven't been as carefully studied. Um, but uh, in generally speaking, if I'm faced, if somebody comes to me and they have a, a clear diagnosis of OCD and I think that they would benefit from medications, uh, I would probably start with one of the SSRIs that I mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. Uh, Chris, I want to shoot this question out at you uh, just quickly. Uh, lady in Blue Jeans 4 said, how can the Biohaven guy say we hope to cure the disorder if you can't control your thoughts? Yeah, I think what really helped me in treatment was learning to have a different relationship with the thoughts. So going into the treatment, that was obviously my first goal was how do I get this disorder out of my head, out of my feelings? I want it gone. Um, what I learned through treatment is we can't control our obsessional thoughts. And once I finally accepted that, it was more so learn to how to change my relationship with the thoughts. And so as time progressed, when I would have these very negative harm or sexual intrusive thoughts, et cetera, I learned that my job was no longer to push them away. It was actually to invite them in and let them hang out with me, but choose not to respond with them in a, in a mental compulsion, such as rumination or a physical compulsion. And so, um, over the years, time after time after time of really reiterating the ERP, exposure response prevention, I found that over the years, my intrusive thoughts become 
much less frequent because I wasn't rewarding them with the behavior. And what I can say now, all these years later, after getting really good treatment, OCD is not the premier thing that I struggle with on a daily basis. Um, if I do have a thought or a feeling, et cetera, I'm easily able to dismiss it because I've gotten really good at telling the difference. Um, I think just like anything, there's always people that are that are out there hoping for a cure. Um, I you know, I, I can't speak for obviously um, the Biohaven uh, company, but look, I am super all for any cure, <laughs> um, of course. But I, I think the biggest goal right now for individuals with OCD like myself to reach for is to get to a point where you have a different relationship with the thoughts, the intrusive thoughts, and really learning how to control your response to them versus trying to get rid of them. Thank you, Chris. Um, Anna asked a really important question, and I'm gonna throw this at Dr. Shemansky. Um, I don't know, Fran, if you'll be able to post the first or second half, so I'll read it slowly. Um, she wrote, before this question, she wrote, as a person of color who struggles with OCD, I know some of the unique experience of people with marginalized backgrounds who struggle with this disorder. I've realized I see few people who look like me included in the, in the advocacy community and in educational resources like this. How do you plan to foster greater representation in, the future, in future projects? Yeah, so we have been working since 2015 as um, in terms of increasing diversity within the foundation, not because it wasn't important prior to 2015, uh, but more because the experience uh, of people coming to conferences, coming to events, um, and it being all Caucasian was uh, increasingly noticeable and problematic. And and our mission actually is to help everyone affected by OCD. What we find when we try to go into communities of people of color is that we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how to connect. We don't know how to access. We don't know how to have a conversation that brings them into the community. So for example, we ran a part of our conference was uh, two of our sessions to begin with were run completely in Spanish. And that evolved over a couple of years into um, an entire conference just spoken in Spanish. And that evolved into a bilingual conference. Um, but we never got big numbers for these uh, for these events. And I think uh, in 2015, the decision was made to talk with researchers, talk with therapists, talk with people of color who, with a lived experience to try and figure out how we can access these communities and bring people in to help uh, problem solve with us. So we've been working with a advi uh, diversity advisory council um, for the past few years, of which Valerie is one of our newest members. Um, she actually had some great ideas about how to move into um, some of these communities. From the level of the board to the staff, um, <clears throat> just across our the larger uh, foundation community, uh, diversity is, is one of our biggest initiatives. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll actually throw this to uh, Jeff again, actually. Uh, Rachel asks, how can I best support a family member struggling with OCD? <clears throat> you know, I think uh, uh, Chris and, and Liz talked about it very well. Uh, and Ethan, I thought you did with your parents as well. Uh, I think family members need to learn about what OCD is. I think documentaries like this are a great way for people to understand kind of firsthand what someone's going through. But, um, and again, what was articulated in the documentary is the thing that is the most um, intuitive to do to help someone who is in distress is the last thing you're supposed to do with OCD. Mm -hmm. So learning about other people's experience of having OCD, getting yourself educated, and really getting into your own treatment if it's, um, if it's a struggle for you uh, in terms of how to respond to your, your loved one. So, um, we're a big advocate of find an OCD specialist. You don't have OCD, but you know Ethan describes it as it's a family affair. Um, so a lot of OCD specialists now will meet with a family member and just continue to educate them either on their own. Um, and increasingly the standard of care is to involve family members in treatment. So if your family member's in treatment, ask to be involved, ask to give a point of view, ask for some coaching and education and help. Yeah, I'll definitely add that my parents really were involved in my in my, in my treatment, as I said, and that takes a lot of the guesswork out. I know a lot of families have to guess, well, I don't know how to respond to my child or my significant other. And um, having a plan of action with your therapist um, as, as a family member or, or somebody who's supporting somebody with OCD is really, 
really important. I'm going to throw this to Chris, and then I, I got a question lined up for Dr. Goodman. Don't worry. Um, actually, I just lost the questions. Uh, hopefully, they're okay. So, Chris, since you were obviously uh, you were an OCD uh, sufferer before you were a a, a a clinician, how do you explain to clients the possible causes of OCD in layman terms without jargon? As Amanda. <laughs> Sorry, Amanda uh, asked, Amanda's, how do you explain to clients without jargon the possible causes of OCD? Yeah, well, that's a really good question, Amanda. Um, you know, obviously, there's so many books out there that can talk about the frontal cortex and talk about the different parts of the brains that are affected, but I, you know, and talk about serotonin, et cetera. But what I try to do is talk from a language that I would have wanted to hear when I was in treatment so people can really understand it. So I try to describe it in ways that make sense to me. So to me, I, I let people know that right now you're in a sometimes low level or high level of panic, of fight or flight, and consistently your brain is going to use its resources to try to keep you safe. Now, obviously, this danger is perceived. It's not real, but your brain does think that it's real. So, you know, you're going to be scanning with your eyes. You're going to be listening for different sounds of things that can trigger you, and your brain is overactive, and it feels like you have an overestimation of danger and an overestimation and consequence of that danger. And what our job is in the in the treatments, you know, scenario to do is to start putting yourself in those scenarios that you once found dangerous or you find dangerous exposure and work on not responding in a compulsive manner. And what that does is it's us reteaching ourselves that certain things we once found dangerous no longer are. So I kind of talk more in, in layman's term because I found me um, when I was, you know, psychiatrists, I love them, but they're too smart for their own good. So when my psychiatrist tried to describe what was going on in my brain, I just checked out. I was like, I, I don't get it. But my therapist, she was kind of cool. She was a little younger and she was able to just talk to me like a human. And that's what I try to explain to people is it feels like you are in so much danger on a constant basis. So we almost got to treat your brain like it needs to be retaught what is really dangerous and what isn't. And so when people kind of understand that and learn that, you know, because the brain has neuroplasticity or the, the ability to learn new things, the more times we put ourselves in those situations, repeated and prolonged, we actually start to learn that something that once felt unsafe starts to feel safe. And sometimes I give them personal uh, examples for myself, you know, being around certain family members, my brain deemed that I might harm, the more often I was around them accepting possibility, I started to learn that that family member was safe to be around. So I try to use examples for my own self that they may relate to so that it feels like something they understand. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, my next, <laughs> like how you said, yeah, you're like, no, I don't like that question. So my next <laughs> question is uh, from Geneva, and this is for Dr. Goodman. Uh, my OCD has been treatment resistant as far as medications go. Months of therapy and anxiety techniques don't help much. Do you have any suggestions for targeted treatment other than CBT or DBT? Um, so when you say that um, your OCD has been treatment resistant, there, there's no one definition that I use to define what treatment resistant is. Um, there, there may be individuals who've tried two different SSRIs, and that means they've been resistant to two different medications, but there are many other SSRIs. There's clomipramine that I mentioned, and then there are what we refer to as augmentation strategies. That's where we might take a medication, let's say it's fluoxetine or Prozac, and it's barely worked. You're tolerating it, but it hasn't really made a huge dent. Uh, so what we might do in that case is add another medication to it that might increase the benefit uh, of acting in a slightly different way. And that's actually the kind of approach that Vlad Korek of Biohaven is talking about is an augmentation strategy. So you might start with a medication like an SSRI that seems to operate on the serotonin chemicals, the chemical system in your brain, but also another chemical system involving glutamate may also be uh, somehow influencing your symptoms, contributing to your symptoms. And so you might need a, a second medication in order to get better control over the OCD. Now beyond medications, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna run out of time here, but there are other there are devices too. Uh, so that, you know, there's a whole host of different treatment options. There's certainly, you know, the, the treatment of first choice, as, you, as you've heard, 
uh, from the individuals who are in the film uh, or is exposure and response prevention. But there's some individuals for whom um, they, can't come, they can't adhere to what they need to do as part of their homework or exposure treatments. And, and that may be because they have depression because depression is a very common complication of OCD. And that's certainly a case where you might be thinking about one of these medications that's both an antidepressant and, and also anti-OCD. But as you get further down the line, and I, I spend a lot of my time, actually I would have to say in the last 10 years, I probably spend most of my time treating patients with so-called treatment-resistant OCD, and they might have tried uh, a, a, a 10 or more different medications as well as ERP, uh, but I, I never give up. I, I never say that I've run out of ideas or options, and including in those options are different devices, including one called Deep TMS. You may hear somebody vacuuming in the background. I'm not responsible for that. I'm gonna have. I, I'm at work, and somebody turned on the vacuum cleaner. So I'm sorry. Could you turn off the vacuum? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you, you may want to turn, let me put myself on mute, maybe get to the next question as I get the We actually on. hear you good, Wayne. We, you just probably can't hear yourself as good. We I hear can't, you I clear. can't hear anything. Oh. Uh, well, Ethan, but, I, wanted to, I wanted to add to what Wayne was saying, just, yeah, just in, in terms of how the, the question was posed, and I don't know anything other than the question, but so when I read something like anxiety techniques aren't working, it might be that you're being taught skills because this person also mentions DBT. So I was trained in DBT. DBT is a good adjunct for some people um, for OCD, but DBT doesn't actually treat OCD. So that's one. So if you're using anxiety techniques in DBT to treat OCD, you're already in the wrong treatment. If you're mentioning CBT rather than ERP, you might be in the wrong treatment because in CBT, traditional CBT, your the therapist might be over focused on cognitive therapy, cognitive restructuring, not terribly helpful for lots of people with OCD. ERP is really where it's at. So what I'll add to that is a style of therapy that has been gaining more traction in the last several years is called acceptance and commitment therapy. <clears throat> and what you're seeing is people are weaving a lot of the the strategies in acceptance and commitment therapy into their ERP. And it's with uh, someone like Lisa Coyne says it supercharges ERP. I like that phrase. But what it's really doing is taking the essence of ERP and what makes it work, but gives it a context so that it's more palatable. So you heard Chris say, I've developed a different relationship with my thoughts. That's a very acceptance and commitment therapy strategy. When you heard Ethan say, I'm not just gonna tolerate my life. I want to engage in a meaningful uh, life that I like living. That's a very apt acceptance and commitment therapy strategy. So look up acceptance and commitment therapy, OCD. There are some people doing great work out there. I think that might be um, an addition. Uh, that's great. Actually, um, sorry, my questions keep disappearing. I hopefully they'll pop back up. Uh, can you bring that up, Fran, one more time? Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I actually, actually, I just wanted to make the, the thing. I feel like I have to do that to look over the question. I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. I just I didn't want to interrupt Wayne because there's lots more important things. I turned off the vacuum. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I just want to say one thing, and then we'll go on to the next question. And unfortunately, Fran, I, I lost the access to. The, oh, they're back. Okay. So I just want to say one thing to Geneva's point, and I know we spent a lot of time on this question, and that is. Um, I think, and I, I know Chris can attest to this too. I think with, unfortunately with OCD and, and, and the struggle and the journey with finding treatment, so, so often we feel like lab rats and it's a really, really awful feeling because not only do we go to a psychiatrist who isn't sure what medication is going to work. So we have to try a plethora of medications. You know, we just want the one that works and going from medication to medication to medication, although part of the actual process may be not described to us at the beginning that that's it is very frustrating. The fact that uh, therapies may not work. I, I went to a million therapists before I found the right treatment. And even then, the right treatment was very difficult for me. 
Um, this whole this whole idea of this years of struggle, this loss of hope, this extreme depression that we all feel really contributes to the stigma. And by the time you find the right treatment, like me, you're just like, I don't buy it. I don't believe you. I don't get it. Um, and so in my own experience with treatment, I know that by the time I got to ERP, I really struggled to embrace it. And and even in some of my later speeches, I say, you know, ERP didn't work for me. I was treatment resistant. I was refractory. Um, I know people were talking about acceptance commitment therapy in the comments earlier. For me, ACT really resonated with me. Um, as it, it really changed my life. But as I as I continued to advocate, I realized something important, and I realized that that it wasn't that I was refractory, that that ERP wasn't working. It, it was merely that I was in a place where I couldn't embrace the treatment. It wasn't the treatment that was failing me. It was, in a way, me failing the treatment, but I don't like the word fail. It was, it was more just my inability to embrace it simply because I'd struggled and suffered with the disorder for so long that I was unwilling to not listen to my OCD. And so, I mean, that's why we're here advocating and doing what we do. So, so you know, people's OCD don't, don't get to the point where mine got or where Chris's got. It gets to that place where you can get in treatment, you can get it early, you know, and um, and get the help you, that you need. So just wanted to just weigh in my two cents. Um, Chris, did you have anything to add to that? I felt you nodding or pre- Yeah, I would say that. Um, I, I'm sad that for me, I had to get rock bottom, but I was, I've always tried to think like if, if, somebody would have approached me six months, a year, two years, five years before I went and got treatment, would I have even been at a place to do ERP? And to be honest, probably not. I mean, I started suffering in high school and the thought of taking medication or doing treatment or even accepting that I had a mental disorder would have just been something I wouldn't have agreed to. I think that's why it's so important the more people that share their stories, the more stigma we can bu stigma we can bust down. If there's somebody in in high school going through cancer or going through a broken leg because of football, the entire community rallies around them. But when we struggle with OCD and we open up about it, a lot of people are mum. So I think the more we can advocate and get the word out, I think a lot more people will be willing to get treatment um, before it gets to that rock bottom. So that was for me. I, I don't know if I would have been open to it until I had to get it. But Wayne said it best. He said, you know, I will not give up on a patient. And I say that in my, I probably gave up on myself before, you know, way before anybody, nobody ever gave up on me. And that's truly why I believe I got better, but I probably, I would, I would have given up on myself. So I think that's, that's a huge part. I want to throw this question out to everyone. This is a great question. This is by Rhonda. And her question is, what about the children of parents with OCD? Their lives are so altered from that of a parent without OCD, especially when the OCD parent is kept in the loop by spousal assurance. That's a great question. I don't know that I've ever heard that question. I throw it out to anybody. Let Jeff answer. Well, you know, again, I think it's 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 a really good question, to, but it's hard. It it is a really good question. So so here's what's very interesting that took, I think the mental health community a long time to wrap their head around because I'm super old. And so even in my training, um, psychotherapy was, an, was for the individual with the disorder. And what you started to see in, in many disorders, it started in schizophrenia with some research showing that how the, the family responded to the affected person's symptoms, um, intensely, uh, affected how symptomatic that person was. And I think it's it's been a long time coming that, and because we've already talked about this, that the family needs to be educated uh, and involved in the treatment. So when I worked at McLean at the OCD Institute, um, everyone had a behavior therapist and everyone had a psychiatrist and everyone had a family therapist and families were involved from beginning to end, but that wasn't always the standard of care. And so I think again, continuing to understand that that OCD doesn't affect the person, it's affecting the whole family. And so if a parent, if I were working with a parent that had OCD, I would be asking the question, can we get other family members in here? Can we help them understand and educate them about what's going on and how they can respond to you? Do they need their own treatment to figure out how to not reassure mom or dad? Um, and that that's an okay thing to do. So I, I feel like it should just be addressed head on. Anyone else? 
I'll just say real quick, I can't um, relate to the question, but my grandfather had OCD. He had severe hoarding to the point that most of his house was, um, you know, uninhabitable. And, you know, I know that it has affected my, my mom and her sisters. And um, now that I have a clear understanding of what it is, and I think also, you know, I'm not going to open up about it because nobody gave me permission, but I have some, I, I don't have any parents with OCD. Um, but I do have parents and family members with other diagnosable mental disorders. And I can tell you that as a, as a son going through um, a parent with that, it, it was really difficult and it's hard. And especially when you're going through it when you're young, you feel so out of control and helpless. So everything Jeff said, I would just echo that. I think the more that the therapy can involve the family, or even if you're a family member of a, if you're a child of a parent with, with OCD, getting your own treatment and therapy with an OCD specialist to really understand can help you heal and control the things that you have control over. So I think it's very important to not focus so much on the other person getting treatment if they're resistant and more so getting the help for yourself. Thank you. And the great question, honestly. Um, we are getting so many questions, which is amazing. Uh, my screen is updating. It can only house so many. So it's unfortunately skipping groups of questions and I can only scroll, scroll so far up. Um, so I will, I will give an email out at the end. Um, and if your question wasn't answered, please email that email and, and we will get an answer to you because I want everybody. I'm going to give out my email, which is ridiculous, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so, uh, so I apologize if I suddenly skip your question. I can't see them all. Um, at this time. Um, Dr. Goodman, what is the earliest a child can show signs of OCD? I, I remember... Uh, Christiana, I, friend, I, sorry. Remember, I remember Judy Rappaport being asked this question. She's one of the uh, pioneers in the field of OCD and, and used to be at uh, NIMH. And, and she said she had diagnosed a child as, as young as two years old. I, I, I haven't... Most of my experiences with uh, uh, adults or, uh, or uh, teenagers, so I, I don't have the, as much personal experience, but I, I think it can be diagnosed um, in, in the early years. Uh, as I think it, you may have had in one of the uh, comments in your uh, uh, film tonight, uh, a typical onset uh, is in about 50% of people with OCD develop OCD before the age of 18. Uh, it tends to be a little bit earlier in boys than girls. Uh, and, then, and then there's a very large number of individuals who develop in early adulthood. And particularly we see that during transitions like going off to college might be the first uh, uh, onset of uh, significant OCD symptoms. And then it's pretty rare to see onset, new onset of OCD uh, after age 35 or 40. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I mean, uh, Jeff, have you had you, you have any experience with you know through the uh, foundation of individuals as in, in you know say in uh, before age twelve? I think I certainly have, but I, yeah, I, I, I think it's that. more common to see it in you know uh, often when, when you see it very early onset, you often see it in combination with ticks or Tourette's, uh, and uh, that's something that hasn't been talked about. But there is a a, a, a probably a biological relationship between certain tick disorders and OCD, and that tends to have a somewhat earlier onset and tends to be um, uh, more prevalent in uh, boys than girls. Yeah, I mean, Ed, so we do hear about this um, kids uh, as young as four and five. Um, in fact, um, at the annual OCD conference, we have uh, programming for three uh, age groups of kids, elementary school kids, middle school kids, and uh, high schoolers. And we have a good number of, of kids in the kids' room um, that range from five to about 11 years old. I think we probably had about 30 or 40 of them this year. So definitely not unheard of. Um, the one interesting thing that I've kind of been paying attention to is that for individuals that are diagnosed with um, what's called PANS, which is an infection-based uh, onset of OCD. For that crowd, we're seeing that um, on average, they're experiencing OCD symptoms uh, younger than, than older. Yeah, and, 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 and that would pretty much parallel what happens with uh, strep throat and, and the fear consequence of rheumatic fever. And that's generally only a risk be below age 15. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, I was actually going to ask a follow up just quickly, which was I kind of feel like I'm running a presidential debate. It's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm, although nobody's interrupting each other yet. Um, <laughs> so so I know you spoke to programming, Jeff. How early can you be treated as a child? What's the earliest that you've seen? Um, I know there are a couple people uh, that specialize in, in working with uh, very young kids. Um, I would say, again, treatment protocols start as early as three. I think we've done a couple trainings at our conference on that. Lisa Coyne is someone who tends to work on average with younger kids. Um, so the protocols really are adaptable. Um, you just have to hmm. modify your language and make it developmentally appropriate. But um, yeah, the treatment protocols for people that are well-trained, which is always the trick, um, are out there. The, the other thing I, I might add is it's it's very common, uh, quite normal, to to see obsessive compulsive like behaviors in mm -hmm. very young children, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go on to uh, mm -hmm. uh, develop into full blown OCD. In fact, sometimes when I when I take a history, say of a young adult who had OCD, and I ask them when it first started, they'll go back. Well, I remember I used to have to say my prayers in a certain way before I go to went to bed. And I had to make sure I didn't leave anybody out. But that's true for a lot of people that don't have mm -hmm. OCD either. So that I, I, th I think it's kind of hardwired into us, particularly uh, when we're young, uh, to for kind of, inter even if you don't have OCD, to maybe do things in a certain very systematic way, particularly at times where, like like going to bed, where you're, it's, it's dark, you're entering a world by when you're by yourself, you know, your parents aren't there uh, to, to develop certain behaviors that give some constancy or consistency, but that doesn't mean it's OCD. Yeah, and we have some great information on our website, ocdandkids.org, that talk about, again, the difference between normal fears and what might then be OCD. But also parents and kids shouldn't be trying to diagnose themselves. I think they want to educate themselves and maybe yeah. even bring that information to a pediatrician or, again, go and if the fears are becoming uh, uh, problematic enough where they're getting in the way of day-to-day -day functioning, then that's the time to maybe consider talking with a therapist and figuring out whether this is a, 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 an OCD diagnosis or not. Thank you. I, I know we're about 30 minutes behind on questions. Um, we probably are not going to get to everybody's. Uh, we'll keep going another 10 minutes probably and then wrap up. I just want to answer a quick question that seems to be going on uh, quick, quickly, which is people are asking if they missed a piece of the documentary. Um, will it be up? The documentary will be left online as is for 72 hours before it'll be taken down. So um, if you missed it, if you missed a part of it, if you have friends, if you want to share it, it will be up for the next three days. So please, please, please um, don't hesitate to share, spread the word, show it as much as you want. Um, it will be available completely for free for the next three days. Um, I do want to uh, quickly add, there's a little bit of conversation going on about um, the Biohaven um, little commercial and uh, and talking about a cure and relating to the question about thoughts that was brought up earlier and um, and how can you curse, cure something that's thoughts that Chris weighed in on. So I see a bunch of comments on that. So I just want to quickly uh, elaborate. Uh, Vlad in the, in, in, the, in the commercial was hoping for a cure in the future. If I understand the question correctly, um, she's at, you're asking, um, but how can you cure something if it's, if it's thoughts? And I, I just want to reiterate what Chris said, which is, first of all, OCD thoughts and non OCD thoughts are exactly the same. All human beings have the same thoughts. And I think suffer, OCD sufferers, we tend to think that our, our thoughts are different. Our thoughts are scarier or more creative or who would ever think some of the terrible sexual or intrusive or violent thoughts that we're thinking. The reality is our thoughts are thoughts are thoughts are thoughts are thoughts. Then there becomes the loop, the getting stuck on the thought, the focus, the reaction to the, hot, the thought and the behavior to the thought, which ultimately becomes the compulsion and the vicious cycle, right? So I think when we talk about a cure, I think we're talking about somehow interrupting that loop, uh, genetically altering. I'm not a doctor, obviously. Played one on TV in 2003, though. Check out CSI Miami. Anyway, um, but but I think we're somehow, you know, that 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 glitch in our brains that makes us sticky to emotionally attach meaning to something. I think that's the cure aspect, but the therapeutic aspect 
of treating OCD is not controlling the thoughts. It's not changing the thoughts. It's changing the relationship to the thoughts. And more importantly, it's changing your response to the thoughts. So, <coughs> and that's ultimately what this is about is, and what happens, I think the loop is when you don't respond to the thought the way OCD wants you to respond, i.e. the compulsion, over time, those thoughts start to quiet down. So just like a bully picking on somebody, if you cry and upset and you give the bully what they want, the bully's gonna continue to pick on you. If, you. if you take the bully's power away by agreeing with him and like, I don't care what you say, say it to me all day long, suddenly the bully backs off. And the thoughts respond the same way. The less you compulse, the less you change your relation, the more you change your relationships to your thoughts, the more you embrace the thoughts, you welcome them, I don't care, I'm gonna follow my values, bring it on. Over time, those thoughts start to quiet down significantly. So I hope that clarified a little bit. Theo asks, Ethan, um, and the friend, this is at eight o'clock if, if, you're, if you're searching for this. Ethan, how can we as parents help without enabling? Our 32 year old son is in ERP therapy about OCD continues to take our, our, over our house. Thank you. So I can definitely relate to this as a 30 or 31 year old, uh, living in my parents' guest bedroom, probably experiencing something very similar that you're experiencing. Um, one of the hardest things to do as a parent is, is one, as they said in the documentary, you know, not reassure or enable. Parenting is completely uh, counterintuitive to treating OCD. Uh, treating OCD is, is all about not reassuring and enabling. And parenting is all about, I don't want my, my child to be hurting. I don't want them to be suffering. I want to fix everything. And so education is, is the number one thing. And I would ask you, Theo, um, if, if you're finding it difficult to, um, it, let me rephrase that. You don't wanna end up being the OCD police. You wanna remain his parents. And, and that's a hard thing to do. So I would say if you're wondering and questioning how to not enable, how to not be the OCD police, how to still help your son, then I would, I would guess that you're probably not engaged in treatment with him simultaneously. And if you are, perhaps there needs to be more engagement. If he's in ERP therapy, I would, I would immediately, there, he's an adult, so they can't share the information with, him, with you, with him that he's giving. But I think a conversation can be had is, here's what we're experiencing in, at home. Would he be open to talking with us? Can we learn to treat this as a family? Because ultimately, you don't need to be guessing how to respond. Your therapist is the OCD police. You need to be his dad. And so I would immediately con contact the therapist. I would touch base. I would ask for a family meeting, seeing if your son would be willing to open up and, um, and see what action items you could put into place to help facilitate the enabling and the reassuring at home. So you literally have a list of things you know to do and not do. Still very hard to do. My parents really struggled with it, but I think that's that's a good place to start. Does anybody have anything else to weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Ethan, that it, it, we talked about this earlier, get yourself involved in the treatment. Um, he's 32 and he lives in your house. So it's your house. You, you don't want to forget that either. And I think that there's a way in which um, a, children that are now adults um, make a deal with their OCD that engages everyone in this kind of blackmail. Uh, Barbara Van Oppen, one of the early pioneers in family uh, therapy for OCD, uh, developed uh, family contract uh, strategies where here's, we understand that it's overwhelming to be treating your OCD. Here's the stuff that we're going to leave alone. Here's the stuff we're going to start now um, putting some limits and boundaries on and that those are negotiated. If he chooses to not involve you in the treatment, as I've said before, there are and again, five, 10 years ago, OCD specialists didn't want to do this. Now many of them are. You don't even need to be, he doesn't need to be involved in the in your treatment. You go and get parental guidance treatment. You get yourself educated. How would you present different kind of limits that you'll be setting with him? So again, he, he can involve you or you can go and get your own coaching. And again, remember that the most compassionate thing you can do is to not give into the OCD. That doesn't mean that you rip the Band-Aid off all, all at once. There's some negotiation that goes on. But at the same time, you're not doing him any favors if OCD is always winning the argument. And that's what my parents did. They slowly applied pressure under, under supervision. 
Because ultimately, when you don't have the responsibility of life weighing on you, then you can ha you have all your free time to indulge the OCD. And so the goal is to start introducing responsibilities into his life like it was to mine, where I had less and less time. Like suddenly, if I indulge the OCD, I wouldn't eat for the day, or I didn't have a roof over my head, or just things that I was taking for granted. So that's a great point, Jeff. Um, Dr. Goodman, are you seeing positive, uh, Stacy Hirschman, 801 PM, Fran, are you seeing positive results when you were adding Nemenda to an SSRI? I, I, I have used it with mixed success. Um, it, it's certainly one of, one of the options that I'll consider in somebody who has uh, failed uh, multiple SSRIs and, and probably failed the low dose of one of the antipsychotic medications like uh, risperidone or uh, Abilify, uh, that's aripiprazole. Um, but but I, 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 so, so it's, 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 it's somewhere in, in my quiver as something to draw upon. Um, and again, I, uh, as I said before, I'll, I'll never, you know, I've never said to a patient, I can't think of anything else that, that we could do. And there's so much individual variation uh, that even what we learn from very rigorous clinical trials that, that may seem ineffective in a particular patient, it may really make a huge difference. So I, I, I so I, I'm basic, my, uh, I'm answering your question based upon my own experience. And I think the literature uh, doesn't give a very clear answer in terms of, um, the, and the studies just haven't been done, the large enough a, a kind of rigorous studies haven't been done to answer your question in a more definitive way. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. Um, Chris, uh, Angela, 802, There's a, it's a two-parter. My son is 10 and has OCD. We are very familiar with ERP, but he has started having crushes and the OCD has jumped on these, making him feel like a bad person and twisting the thoughts. Do you have suggestions for how to use ERP for these sexual intrusive thoughts for someone so young? It's a great question. Yeah, I think when working with a child, I mean, I think the biggest important thing is making sure to talk in a language that they speak. And, um, you know, at 10 years old, there's not a huge understanding on, on you know, sex and, and relationships, et cetera. I mean, I can relate to the question because these are some of the same thoughts I had. And, and you know, starting to have those thoughts for me at 16, obviously I was a little bit older than 10, but when I first entered treatment, the conversation that my therapist had was age appropriate. I think the bigger, bigger picture that I've learned over the years is, yes, it is important to treat the subtype, but on a larger scale, all of OCD subtypes are similar. And so really kind of working with the kid of understanding the bigger picture, you're going to have these thoughts that feel sticky and they feel scary. And OCD wants you to run from them and hide from them. But we really have to learn that they're not our enemy. It's, it's how we treat them. So it's always difficult when you're trying to explain something with such a taboo topic to somebody that young. But I think sometimes if you get too caught up in the actual thought, you start to play into the OCD. You start to play into the thought and the reassurance and trying to convince them and it's never going to work. So taking a step back and really explaining kind of the dynamics of OCD and how it's affecting that person, there may need to be some cognitive behavioral therapy first. If the person is 10, they might just in general be a little bit confused about thoughts and crushes. So having a, a general explanation of that. But when it comes to the actual OCD itself, it's really being able to explain it in a way that they can understand it. And then ultimately having them recognize that even if it was contamination, even if it was scrupulosity, at the end of the day, this is OCD's mechanisms to trick you um, as a 10 year old. And it's really about not falling for the trick. And I want to say something real quick about this kind of topic with like sexual, intrusive, et cetera. Um, there, was, there was a question that I kind of saw scrolling by about, about this as well. Um, you know, when somebody has more intrusive thoughts based, people usually ask, well, how do I treat that? I don't have any um, compulsions. I only have obsessions. And I think it's really important to, to explain that there are still compulsions going on when you have taboo intrusive thoughts. They usually look like avoidance or rumination or trying to thought stop. And at the end of the day, as scary as those thoughts come in, we really learn to not 
repulsed by them and not to push back. Now, as somebody that had thoughts of harming family and having sex with family members and, and stuff like that, it's easier said than done. But when I finally got to a point that I recognized my brain with OCD is going to go to the craziest, darkest depths of my brain and, and throw some really repulsive thoughts and feelings at me. But it is my job, because I can't control that, it is my job to choose not to engage. I'm not gonna try to freak out, I'm not gonna argue with the thoughts, avoid the thoughts or seek reassurance. I'm gonna embrace them, I'm, gonna, I'm going to accept them, and I'm gonna let them live with me and do what they wanna do. And over time, since they're not getting reinforced, they're gonna fade on their own. But to, to wrap it, lastly, to wrap it back to 10, once again, what can really help is not getting too um, focused on the, the content of the thoughts. That usually actually gets people more stuck in the thoughts and it's more having the 10 year old learn that he's gonna have those intrusive thoughts. And they're, I, I, I like to externalize OC for kids, have them name it, draw it, understand that it's kind of like a, a trickster that's gonna try to get them really consumed on it. But their job is to not change any of their behaviors or reactions by simply having a thought. Yeah, you're seeing a consensus. It, you're seeing a consensus in the in the therapy community that content of thoughts doesn't matter. It's it's completely irrelevant. You need to know what the content of the thoughts are to do the exposure. But that's about it. And this naming different subtypes, I actually ended up in a conversation with my scientific advisory board. Wayne, you were on this chain where someone said, "There's this new concept of of the subtype of OCD," and everyone on the list server was like, "No, it's." OCD is OCD is OCD. There are some nuances with certain kinds of subtypes, but for the most part, it's as Chris was saying, it's about using this, the ERP strategy, no matter what is coming at you, it's the same strategy, it's the same treatment. You don't need to modify anything. And lastly, I'll just jump on what Jeff said. The reason what Jeff said is so important is because as we all know, sometimes the content of our thoughts or our subtype jumps to something else. And if you start to treat OCD as a big whole versus individual subtypes, mm -hmm. it's not as scary for a new subtype to pop up because it's the same mechanics that you've, you've used before. So that's why I think it's so important to focus less on the content. OCD is just using a content it knows will bug you because it's something you care about. But in general, if you take a step mm -hmm. back, it doesn't matter what things jump to, you already know how to handle it with exposure and response prevention. I've always visualized it like a reverse Mad Lib <laughs> you know, Mad Lib, you put it instead, the reverse Mad Lib is like ERP is all over and there's one blank and you just insert whatever the OCD symptomatology or subtype is. Works for it all. Works for it all. Um, unfortunately, we're, we've, we're out of time. I know uh, you guys asked um, some amazing questions. Uh, before uh, you guys start signing off, I just want to tell you guys, I'm going to give out an email. Um, there's a lot of people here. Uh, so, so. I always like to connect with people. If you have a question, if you want to connect, eth, uh, email, it's ethocd at gmail.com. That's E-T-H-O-C-D at gmail.com. Email your question and um, we'll make sure you get an answer. Be patient. <laughs> Be patient. Can't answer everything right away. Um, but but please reach out and we'll definitely uh We'll definitely come back to you. go ahead and bring the four back in. I just want to thank um, uh, Chris Tronsden again, uh, Dr. Jeff Shemansky. I'm saying it like I don't know who they are. I'm, I'm like excited to read. Uh, Dr. Wayne Goodman. I just want to give you guys uh, any last thoughts mm. that you'd like to throw out. Well, I, I, I wanted to thank you, Ethan, you, Chris, and everybody in, involved in the film tonight. It was really courageous to, to be sharing your struggles with OCD. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, lots of people who are watching it tonight were able to resonate with it and it will help them uh, be able to realize that the OCD uh, is kind of an inhabitant of their brain uh, and that outside the OCD, they're completely normal. That's always what strikes me. That's what struck me about everybody you included in the film today. Uh, and that's why they're so uh, some of them talked about how they could keep it a secret for so many years because there's not there's nothing wrong with them other than what the OCD uh, tries to uh, manipulate uh, in in terms of their behaviors. Uh, so anyway, so I want I, I want you, that's what I want to close on. I want to, I want to thank thank you for putting this together and uh, I'm really really uh, grateful. As you know, uh, I've been uh, pouring 
uh, part of the advocacy community for a long time. And thank you for your work. Thank you. We're very grateful for you. Uh, Jeff, any last words? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, I think it is actually pretty cool that Biohaven sponsored this documentary because it has pharmaceutical companies participating in the mental health community in a different way. And so I think that that's pretty cool. I think, uh, Ethan, you did an awesome job in directing this. And I know pretty much everyone in that documentary, and I love all of those people. So I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who participated in, in it. And, and finally, Ethan, you, as always, are, are offering yourself as a resource. We do also, in terms of getting questions asked, we do also have a person on staff full time who takes calls, emails all, all the time, every day. Um, helps with resources, helps answer questions in addition to what Ethan's offering. So, it did my closing, I swear. It did my closing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I, but I always just wanted to say that to yeah, you. Yeah, no, definitely. And then Chris, man, what can I say? You guys, can I just share? Chris and his mom on the day were absolutely amazing, spectacular, great, oh. real, um, heartbreaking. Just, I can't say enough about about this guy here. Uh, he's he's a... Uh, a hero, a friend, an advocate, a, uh, a mentor, a, a partner in crime, so to speak. Um, I, I love this guy a ton. Um, yeah, Chris, any any last words? Yeah, I just want to first say um, what I hope people got from that documentary is hope. Um, I know a lot of the people in it as well, and we all have di different journeys, but we were able to get the treatment we needed and get better. I always want to shout out the International OCD Foundation. I mean, I, I like many people, sought really poor treatment for almost a year until my mom found the International OCD Foundation, which led us to um, the proper treatment. So I always say thank everybody as part of the IOCF. But um, I, I just want to say that for everybody watching and everybody that's going to watch this, please know that there's hope. And I want them to take that from that. And then lastly, um, you know, Ethan's an incredible advocate. There's so many great advocates, but I want to remind people, no matter where you are in your treatment, you're still an advocate. And the more that you open up about what you're going through, the more that you share and the more that families take that and understand that and, and really open up about it we're going to stomp out that stigma. And I always say like my goal and my dream is one day that people will treat physical or will treat mental health just as seriously as physical health. And lastly, I want to shout out my mom because she is watching and she's amazing. And I know that she felt great being kind of a parent representat representation. I would have never gotten here without all of her hard work. So I just want to thank her. Um, and that's where I get my, my smile and my looks from. So I want to thank her for that too. <laughs> just kidding. But thanks, Ethan. You, what, more of a knockoff, no? <laughs> I'm like the light version, the, yeah, the no man right. brand of it. But I do want to thank you, Ethan. I mean, this was incredible. And I can see through the comments how many people are helped. So thank you, IOCF, everybody. I, I love you guys. Stick around. And I'm going to tell you why. Thank you guys so much. Um, I know in a lot of the comment section, everybody was wondering, um, what's the connection with Biohaven? Who is Biohaven? Um, what are they? What do they do? Pharma, question, whoa, red flag. So I definitely want to address that. So, um, so I want to introduce you to uh, Leah Donahue. She's the Senior Director of Clinical Operations at Biohaven. She has 20 years of experience in academia in the pharmaceutical industry, predominantly in the areas of psychiatry and neurology. So Leah's going to scoot in here. Hello, everybody. So I know a lot of, I saw a lot of questions. Let's just re-angle a little bit. I saw a ton of questions um, about pharmaceutical and, and, and why and what they're, what they're here for and what they're doing. Let, let's be, we can throw it on the board. You guys got a bad rap. We do. <laughs> we do. Um, and I think we, first of all, we want to thank Ethan and everyone that was in the video, Chris, and everyone else, Chris, your mom who's listening, um, that created this for not only Biohaven, but everyone in the OCD community. And I think we do have, pharma has a bad stigma, and we're also trying to knock down that stigma. Um, as everyone on, on listening knows, OCD hasn't had a new medication approved since 1997. And we're really trying to work on um, making treatment better for patients, whether that treatment may look different for everyone. It may be ERP for someone, maybe an SSRI for someone else, whatever works for you. But we're really trying to um, help in that field. And Vlad Chorich, who you saw speak before, and there was some comments coming up about pharma, um, he is our CEO and he's our founder. 
and he um, started off at Yale as an OCD specialist. This is absolutely his passion, and that's probably the main reason why we're doing this study. So let's, I just want to repeat that. So there's been no new OCD medication in the last 22 years. Um, and I have to tell you guys, they, they've been a pleasure to create content. And like I said, the documentary originally wasn't for public consumption. Um, they, they came to me and we're like, we have to do it. We have to add people and let's show it to the world. So I think my first question is, and I've learned this, that, that most pharmaceutical companies have moved away from, from mental health in in um in search of sort of more money with uh, other uh, you know other like cancer and things like that so why is it important for biohaven to stay with mental health and neurology in general why is it important? okay so there's a couple of things i want to answer there i think um as i said our ceo is a psychiatrist same with our chief medical officer is a psychiatrist um many of you probably haven't heard of biohaven because we're a relatively new startup company um, and most of us in the research and development area of the company have come from Big Pharma. And we all worked in psychiatry and neurology. And when Big Pharma sort of moved away from those areas, we have all been very passionate about psychiatry and neurology and making a difference there and continuing to try to get new medications and new treatments for um, psych psychiatry and neurology. And so we're passionate about that area of research, and that's why we've all come to Biohaven. And Jeff said it. Jeff said the partnership with Biohaven is a really exciting thing. It's a really exciting opportunity. And I just want to say um, there's a reason for the partnership, and and it's important to uh, to point out because the partnership came from this observation in what you do here, which was almost what the medication that you're developing is important. But it's not the end all be all for you. It's mm -hmm. it's the community. You reached out to the community. You reached out to the foundation. You wanted to create content to help educate, to help reduce stigma. Your presence has been at the IOCDF conference for two or three years. Being a part of the community is important. Is is really really important to Biohaven. And what where does that come from? Why is that? Why why is it so much more than just the medication? Right. So that's very true. So I think that, you know, a lot of people say this, a lot of companies say this, but I do truly feel like, um, you know, we're mothers, we're brothers, we're sisters, um, we're, we're, we're children. We are real people ourselves, too. And when we see um, when we started this clinical trial and saw the stigma that is going on in OCD and actually how much even our researchers didn't understand the disorder. And we got connected with Ethan and made this documentary and saw the impact. The documentary was initially made for our researchers and clinicians and psychiatrists to view and to make sure that they truly understood OCD and how to treat it and to also um, help destigmatize and help them understand the kind of issues that would be brought forth by their patients. But when we saw the outcome, we knew and and the type of company we are is that we want to share that. Um, there's no need to keep that with our clinicians and researchers. This is something that as we can see and as we're all sitting in, a, in another conference room listening to this, tearing up that it really affects so many people. And this documentary, um, just looking at all of your comments, we know that it can help the community. And if it can help the community, then that's what we want to do. There is no, we are not in this to keep this to ourselves and to not help educate others and destigmatize hopefully others. Thank you, Leah. For me, this is hope. I mean, this is hope. This is this is this is a turning point where um, where we can get back to research and how, back to helping the community on a pharmacological level, on a therapeutic level, all in the hopes of of, of an eventual cure. But you know, at best, treatment for for all and understanding and destigmatization and everything. So. Thanks, Leah. Thank you, guys. All I'm going to do is turn this now. That's much better. It's just on me. <laughs> um, so last but not least, um, I just want to thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, the numbers that we saw preliminary were amazing, and I'm just, I'm touched. I'm very touched and very moved and, and at a loss for words, which, if you know me, is a rare occasion. Um, so just some quick things. If you have family, friends, or anyone else, as I said before, 
Uh, the documentary will be up and stay up for 72 hours for three days. So please, please, please feel free to invite, share, spread the word, post, whatever you want to do. It is there for you. Um, again, if we didn't get to a, a one of your questions, uh, I gave out my email. I love to connect. I love to reach out. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you just feel alone and want to connect, email me um, at ethocd at gmail.com. Um, I, I always will answer all the emails. It may take me time, some time to get through, but I always get back to you. Um, and also, as Jeff said, you can always, always, always reach out to the International OCD Foundation as well, and preferably um, um, tons of amazing resources and facts, everything from OCD education. So many of the questions that you were asked are answered on their website. They have amazing videos, they have amazing resources, they have links to other resources, as well as finding therapy in your area. They have a huge directory of clinicians and, um, and doctors where you can just type in your zip code, state, city, and a list will come up near you. Um, so definitely, 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 if you haven't, check out iocdf.org. Um, finally, just a massive thank you to Biohaven, a massive thank you to the International OCD Foundation, who's, I just have to say on the IOCDF, I just, I, I always say thank you, but I, I, I started speaking in 2012 and I wouldn't leave Jeff alone from that moment. I was really like, I have to tell my story. I have to tell my story. I'm going to keep bugging you until you let me tell my story. And they have been just the most incredible, supportive, collaborative partners in advocacy I could ever ask for. They've given me a platform to scream my story, uh, to make sure that my story isn't everybody else's story, um, and to, to give hope and help. You know, um, Liz McInville always says, you know, my story shouldn't be the exception. It should be the norm. And, and that is absolutely right. You know, this is not about me. We are all a small part of a bigger picture. We are, we are all a team here trying to accomplish one goal, and that is to get all of OCD sufferers and mental illness, frankly, the help, um, and the help and the hope that they need in an effort to not have to live a life that we did. So please know there's always help and there's always hope. Um, as Chris said, uh, my heart is full. I have nothing more to say. Go to the foundations, check out the websites, email me. You are not alone. You are heard. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, we look forward to doing this again soon. Thanks.